go drive up on the parkway yesterday. Oh, okay. Because that's what I do when I get stuck. Uh -huh. You were talking about how the woods and um, Langhorne Road, which my uncle used to ride horses okay. from over at Forest all the way to Graves Mill because it was all woods when right. we were kids yeah. back yeah. there. Anyway, thanks for that. I do. Sure. <laughs>
we could give it to them, we can see how that volume is over there. So, um, good afternoon. Hi. I'm Martha Johnson, Director of the Mayor Museum of Art at Randolph College, and I'd like to welcome you to the 28th Annual Helen Clark Berlin Symposium. This symposium is always held in conjunction with the college's annual exhibition of contemporary art. We are surrounded today by the 108th annual exhibition, Children's Book Illustrations, Visual Storytelling, curated by Kathy Newman, Professor of Studio Art here at <laughs> Before we get started, I'd like to thank someone who couldn't be here today, Mary Gray Shockey, class of 1969 and former trustee of the college's generously supported every annual exhibition since the 100th, including this one. If you feel enriched by this exhibition, Mary deserves much of that gratitude as she has made this possible. The annual exhibition of contemporary art is one of several important traditions and contributions that make up the Louise Jordan Smith legacy. Smith was one of the first five resident professors when the college was founded as Randolph Macon Women's College in 1891. In 1900, she declared, I want an annual exhibition. It should be understood that each year the best pictures should be purchased for a permanent collection. If the history of our nation may be foreseen by the light which other nations give us, we may know that our influence will last longest through our art. The first annual exhibition was installed in 1911. On the occasion of the 80th annual exhibition, friends and family of Helen Clark Berlin, class of 1958, established a symposium in her honor, which would expand and extend the educational impact of the exhibition. This year's symposium is also supported by three of our members, Julie Johnson McGowan, class of 69, Allison Gold Muller, class of 1971, and Dana Davidson Redmond, class of 1960. Professor Muehlman will moderate today's discussion. She has had solo exhibitions in numerous galleries and museums in the US. Her work has also been included in shows in Australia, China, Finland, and Italy. Her paintings have been reviewed in the New York Times, Art Forum, Art in America, Art News, and Arts Magazine, among other publications. Her work is in the collections of prestigious museums, including the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Miami, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, and the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., to name a few. She has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and from the Simon Guggenheim Foundation. She was awarded a Rome Prize from the American Academy in Rome and in 2017, she was honored by the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Thank you, Kathy, for curating such a wonderful exhibition, and I turn the program over to you. Digitally. 
But the artists that are here in this exhibition and Charles Bessie's work is done on paper and boards. And I am so grateful for that because it allowed us to install this exhibition really addressing our primary audience, although you all are very important to us. But the exhibition was thought about as for the children of Lynchburg in Virginia. And as such, the work was installed at child height. We had a wine bar at the opening, but we also had a cookie bar at the opening. <laughs> <laughs> and I think really hanging it at their height, it addressed them in a way that when we hang things higher, it seems like it's just for big people. So there's a wonderful photographs of the children at the opening looking at the work. And there, some of them are on the website. Today we're really honored to have two artists here. Charles Best, who is not in the exhibition, but we were so thrilled of his, about his talk the other night here at this museum and that he would be part of the panel. And that is in keeping with the Berlin Symposium. Often we have curators or educators or other artists on the panel as well as the ones in the exhibition. And that's a way to expand different approaches to thinking about the work. We are lucky because Charles was recently in Europe accepting awards, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we get him here, to, one of the reasons we get him here today is he's here for his 50th anniversary of his high school, EC class, because he is a native of Lynchburg, Virginia. And he's even stepped out of all the festivities today to come be with us this afternoon. Charles Best creates detailed epic and ethereal fantasy illustrations. His work has been featured in many comic book publishers, including Marvel, Spider-Man, Raven Banner, DC Comics, Books of Magic, Swamp Thing, and Sandman, and Dark Horse Comics, Book of Night. His portfolio includes illustrations for science fiction and fantasy books, including Stardust, for which he created 175 illustrations. And that became a motion picture and had such people as Ian McClellan, and Robert De Niro, Claire Danes, Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> big, big time. But you often don't think when you make a book, it's going to be on a big screen. But he, he was able to do that. Um, the Cats of Tanglewood Forest and his recent release, 2018, which is a really big, you can use it as a book stop too, The Books of Earth Sea by Ursula Marina. It's a wonderful book. Um, over the course of his 45-year career, Charles has received numerous awards, too many to name them all. Am I echoing? No, you're fine. Here are just a few. The Inkpot Award for Excellence in Comic Book, the prestigious World Fantasy Award four times, the Will Eisner Comic Book Industry Award two times, and that's considered one of the Oscars in the comic book world. A few Chesley Awards and two Lotus Awards for Best Artist and Best Art Book. Other accolades are for illustrations in young adult books and the cover art for his first children's picture book, a Circle of Cats, 2003. <laughs> <laughs> and here it is. <laughs> this is a beautiful book. Um, in August, Fest won two Hugo Awards for the World Science Fiction Convention in Dublin. He was named Best Professional Artist and won Best Art Book for the Books of Earth Sea. Charles received a BFA from Virginia Commonwealth University, and as a Lynchburg native, he is a graduate of E.C. Glass High School. He lives on a small farm in southwestern Virginia where he works from his studio called Green Man Press. Some of what Charles is about. And now we move on to Larry Day, whose entire book found, including the storyboards for that book, which is really special, are in the back wall. 
Larry Day is an award-winning illustrator of both fiction and non-fiction books. He received an associate's degree in commercial art and worked as a staff artist for pinball and video games before becoming a storyboard artist and picture book illustrator. He has received numerous awards and praise for his books. In 2006, Day was awarded the Golden Kite Award from the Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators um, for his book, Not Afraid of Dogs, written by Suzanne Pitzer. His 2014 illustrations for Lion Lion by Marion Bausch, whom he's married to, Bush, Bush I'm sorry, Bush, garnered NPR's Best Book for 2014, a Bank Street College Best Book of the Year, and the book was a Junior Library Guild selection. Day is also the recipient of three gold medals from the Society of Illustrators. His complete illustrations were found, written by Jeff Newman in 2018, are included in this exhibition. Day's newest book, Beware, a picture book by Bob Rashka, has just been published. Right? It should be up. Yeah, it's this month. Yes. And and Larry wrote a beautiful statement. I'm going to read it because I think it is it illuminates a lot of, of what I hear from him. This is him. I grew up in a small rural midwestern town where, beginning at an early age, I drew everything around me. And what I didn't draw, I observed. Art became even more meaningful to me after I flunked high school art class. <laughs> Students should have some hope. <laughs> I, I knew I was searching for something other than macrame and decoupage. Not that those things don't have their place. But I was searching for the emotion of things, and I've been at it ever since. Whether I'm drawing advertising storyboards or figuring out a picture book art, I immerse myself in the character's story. I love the challenge of visually depicting a story's heartbeat. With a wordless book like Found, art truly becomes text, and my job is to carry that heartbeat throughout. There are so many possibilities and angles, and I generally end up by trying and revising and trying again. I don't stop until a little voice says, yep, you know macrame today. Please welcome our artist. Oh, 
Well, I was uh, I was a storyboard artist before I got into picture book right? uh, illustrating, and I was not a um, kind of I'm kind of a kind of an accidental picture book illustrator because I just thought, hey, I'm doing storyboards. It sounds kind of similar to a picture book. Why don't I just try picture books also? I needed more work, you know. Just kidding. I was already working like you know seven days a week, no vacation or anything. So I just needed to do something else besides that on top of it. So I, I contacted a couple of agents and I sent them my work, um, samples of basically storyboard work. Um, I landed an agent and from there she started giving me more and more work. And um, that's how I got into it. So that's probably back in 91. And I'd already been doing storyboards since 87. Um, so, I mean, you know what? Can you talk about what a storyboard is other than for a book, like for the advertising Yeah, for the ad world, yeah. for the advertising agencies. I worked at Leo Burnett in Chicago for 30 some years. And a storyboard is basically um, the commercial idea, but in maybe one frame or uh, which is what we call a keyframe, um, and or up to like I did a Samsung spot with like forty some frames, um, and the, actually the commercial was already done, but they wanted to see Samsung is weird, and they wanted to see like how this was done by an artist, and they did my work. They said we want to see how he does it, how he's thinking of it. So um, yeah, it's you know, so they can be ranged from one frame to typically 12 frames for a 30 second spot. That's, and also I did a lot of print, which is not done to illustrate. Illustrators don't do much print anymore for print ads and magazines. Um, that's what it, so that was a natural progression for me to go from storyboarding at the ad world to storyboarding with picture books. It's not that different, it really isn't. It's just that um, you're still telling a story in a brief amount of time, and you've got to hit all the heartbeats, you've got to hit everything. And so, you, and you have to know what to leave out, which is almost more important as what to put in. And that's how I, how I got into picture illustration. And, and you said earlier today, you, you talked about Egon Schiele, uh -huh. the Austrian artist, that you learned from him about color spot and the, and the weight of mind, and you, you referred to your book, found. Um, Right, I think that's important. So your influences can really generate um, a different way of looking at things, or give you the confidence, which is probably even more important. Well, he did it, so I guess I can do it. So it, it just kind of legitimizes, it legitimizes the whole process of. And then once I started doing spot color, all these art directors were like, "Hey, can you do my spot color?" You know, <laughs> and so, and actually. When I started doing storyboards, I was doing them in the traditional medium with markers. So I would have like uh, 12 markers in this hand and just pull out and pull, pull the marker out of this hand to use on the board, on the paper. And then an art director actually inspired me because he was doing his storyboards with a uh, watercolor pencil and anything he could grab. And he was going on vacation and I had to take over for him. He said, can you finish this campaign for, I don't know who this one. Um, I think it might have been Lowe's or something. Like that. I said, sure. So I, I copied his style with these watercolor pencils that I never used before. And then I thought, well, screw the markers. I'm just going to use it. It's so much easier. So, yeah, so I draw directly, I draw the pencil frame directly on the paper and then watercolor. He can do I think your uh, your reference to uh, Egon Schiele as a rep as a inspiration is really important. Of whether you, what doesn't matter what field you're working in, but don't just study the field that you're in. Look broader of field, uh, fine artist, uh, whatever, and you'll you'll have a a fresher approach to your image making or your story writing. 
than if you, all you ever studied was uh, the age group that you want to write in children's books. It, uh, the same thing happens way too often in comic books. They only look at other comic book artists and they need to have more and different influences to be more interesting. Do you keep a sketchbook, Charles? Or, or so no. do you do I have a lot of blank ones. Most <laughs> <laughs> people give me sketchbooks. Yeah. I, I draw right on the page. And I, uh, if I, uh, and it's, I used to keep sketchbooks and I would get, you know, the, the perfect uh, gesture in the sketchbook, and then I would try to copy it. Of course, you, can. you cannot copy it. So I tend to want to draw it right on the page that I'm working on, finish it. I uh, use a pretty sturdy paper. I do a lot of erasing. I think uh, an eraser can be really important. And uh, draw, and then ink, and then put my color on top of that inking all on the same page. Uh, as soon as you start transferring off it becomes further and further removed from that gesture that you've got and it gets deader and deader. So. Yes. One thing I wanted to add about the Haven thing is it's the important thing about um, influencing about let's see, let me put it this way. You've got to go see the originals. Yes. You've got to put the internet's machine down. Uh, physically make the effort to go see the originals and also, your libraries are filled with volumes of books and magazines that you just got to go through. Because you're never going to see this stuff anywhere else, even, even with the internet. You know, that 98% of everything out there is not scanned. Yeah. And seeing the original, the artist talks to you. And it won't, if you watch it, if you see it on the screen, it doesn't have that. You won't have the same conversation. Like you, a lot of years ago, I wrote and drew a Spider-Man short story so that I could fly to London and go to the Tate Gallery and sit in front of <laughs> William Waterhouse's Lady of Shalott and, and as an extra bonus, right next to it was uh, Malay's Ophelia. And it was you know, a life-changing experience to be in front of that real art. And it, doing that, and the size is always different. Uh, it's just a really good experience. And going into a nice museum, you'll see things that you will never have heard of before, and sometimes it can change your life seeing that image. Even if you're not an artist, it's yes. a to go. <laughs> <laughs> you, you lived in Chicago, so you must have gone to the Art Institute. Were there particular paintings that knocked you over? Um, yeah, it was a ton of fellows, um, any painting by then. I would go into the print drawing room, which was, which are gems, unspoken, unspoken right. gems of museums, because it's the stuff they have in their archives. And I would go in there and ask to see the Winslow Homer archives, and they have a lot of them, they have 20s. And so what they do is they just bring them all out, put them up, they're right there in front of you, they're not even framed. Um, you can't cough on them, <laughs> but they're right there in front of you. And I would—I always want to go see the Domiers because nobody, I don't think, even they got at times that Domier just was so superior about body image yeah. in his art. And and there's you can see like his originals, and then you can see the uh, etching or the or the woodcut or right. the engraving. Right. And there's such a difference. It's like what you're talking about. His originals had that spirit and that connection that the wood wood engravings yeah. don't. Right. But um, and that when I saw that, I thought I gotta keep to my originals. I gotta keep as close to my originals as I can. And he did these beautiful heads of the Parliament, I don't know, you know, or politicians, and they're in the National Gallery. Washington, D.C. Yeah. And Charles, you were talking about he did this beautiful, large sculpture, and then you found it was almost easier to work, express yourself in the clay than it's it was. It's really easy to do the foreshore. Can, can you talk about that? Can you talk about 
about moving from one medium that you're very familiar with to something new. And well, it's, it's scary as hell, uh, but it's incredibly useful. Uh, you getting out of your zone of comfort and going somewhere where you, you know, using a different medium, using a different paper, whatever. When you come back to what you do, you bring all sorts of new thoughts and ideas, and it makes your art better. It's uh, it's sort of a, not easy to define, but I know that it happens. And it's really uh, uh, when I. I, I designed, I was asked to design a 16-foot bronze sculpture in Abingdon, Virginia. It's out front of the Barter Theater. And I'd never really done anything much like that. I've done small sculptings that you put in your stove at home. <laughs> That's all I'd ever done. And uh, so here I was drawing this, and I thought that's all I was going to have to do. But the, the person I'd been partnered up with who was a longtime bronze artist, wasn't there very often, and I had to keep sculpting, so it became most, 90% of it is my sculpting, and then I poured the bronze, and then it went on and on and on and on. So three years, uh, she became, my wife would uh, reference her as my bronze mistress, <laughs> that I spent with. And um, so three years, and the most I ever drew really, during that three years was uh, with a ballpoint pen on a piece of paper really quick to come up with some gesture or some kind of thing. And I was, as I, as the project drew to an end and it was being unveiled and everybody was clapping, I was worried about what's going to happen when I go back to my studio. I really didn't know. And what happened was, <laughs> again, before I did the sculpture, I would draw like that and gouge into the paper and all that stuff. After the sculpture, for whatever reason, I was drawing like this, and suddenly everything was easier. And it's been so ever since. So, yay. <laughs>
how did they go from start to finish? How, how were they thinking? And it even actually goes back to Frank Bragman, um, that Cornwell studied mural painting with Frank Bragman. So it's not just that language. It's, it's also, I mean, it's not those people exactly. I mean, it's also others, sure, sure. many others, you know, but those were the, the big ones. And then um, you start looking at their work more closely because of that reason, yeah. that you, you have a history of them. Which mentioned Howard Pyle, Howard Pyle, and we're in Lynchburg. One day, this would have been, I think, in college, so it was 1970. I was down in one of the antique shops downtown. I was leaving to the to the thing, and there was a Howard Pyle drawing from the Wonder Clock, which is my very favorite wow. book in the entire world, and it had an inscription to a, I forgot who it was, and signed Howard Pyle. And I looked at it, there was no price on it. Oh. <laughs> Life is fraught. <laughs> so I went up to the desk and went, how much is this? And the guy was looking at it and finally went, well, it's framed. How about six fifty? Six dollars and fifty cents. I went, okay, and gave him the money and walked out of the shop going, oh please don't run after me. <laughs> and I had it for a very, very long time. I moved to New York City and I was flat broke and I really did want to eat. And I sold it. And I will never get that again. And it just was such a beautiful thing that it was Howard Pyle, who I love, and from one of my very favorite books he'd ever done. And that'll never happen again in my life. But you did it for a while. I had it for a while. That's right. I never still who has it now. I'll just break it. Beginning of the year, the librarian would take us and put us in front of certain stacks and say, "This is these are the books for your grade." And I had loved it until that year. When I opened the books, the type was smaller. But what was worse, there were no pictures. No. And Larry, this morning you said that art is your first, is your first language, and English your second language, and you had created this beautiful book without words. Can you talk to the difference between making a book with words and without words? Well, one of the things about learning uh, storyboarding and in picture books is, is this great thing that I, I um, kind of define those two fields as um, art becomes text. So I think when I look at something, and I think visually, how does this, how does this communicate? Because um, I really don't like writing. I've tried it. I <laughs> just have to put it in the ass. <laughs> I, can go, I can hit it much quicker if I draw it. So I'm there sooner, or more, I'm there more effectively because it's hard for me to put a sentence together. So um, I leave that to Mary. But, yeah, there's, um, I don't know if I answered your question, yes, but yeah, the art is text. It's not that it becomes text, it is text to me. Yes. I, I work, one of my, I've got several unfinished projects that maybe one day will be published, and one of them is a middle grade novel that's told with text and, in, and graphic narrative and images. And when I was working on it, because I do like to write, I think it's really, I enjoy it. But I was working on it and I decided that I had a drawing that I really liked that I wanted to drop into the text. And then I realized that if I put a word balloon in there and had text, then the art became really physically the text. And it was really like, oh, and I hadn't thought about that before. That was really fun. But those little, things that you can do and I, it's uh, so far scared every editor that's ever looked at because it. it's not how, what do you call it i don't know how to market this so it's one of those things that i will probably self-publish or whatever because after a while you're like i just want to get it out there and it's done i have very i've had two stories in my life that have come straight into my brain and told themselves to me and i've written them down and i'd like to have them out there 
talk about collaboration this morning. You said there were people you trust and people you don't. And you also talked about having a placing a storyboard on the kitchen counter where Marion would pass by or you would pass by. And you welcome some of her suggestions. Yeah, well, Mary, she's uh, an author, and we've done two books together uh, for Harper Collins, and then we'll, we've got another one floating out there, hopefully trying to find a buyer. Well, this is the third round of publishers. and But what we do is, and, and your first question is, I choose who I collaborate with because that's really important. Because um, you can, uh, the, wrong, the wrong person can really muddy up your stuff and you just lose interest. You know, it can really um, do a lot of damage if you pick the wrong person. I would never pick anybody in my family. <laughs> Sometimes you would pick the janitor, but sometimes you wouldn't. It depends on how well you know them. And there's a, there's a trust thing. You know, you, you trust that that person understands story, even if they're not an artist. You trust that that person can understand pacing, can understand how things unfold, and, you can under, and they can understand what does it mean to you. So they're not trying to interject. They're, they're uh, philosophies or emotions into the story. They're trying to like the best people to collaborate with are people that understand what you want out of the story and knowing a good way to get there. But so Miriam and I, when we're working on a book, I storyboard it out, cut out, cut it out, and I just usually draw it on just um, uh, printing paper. You know, just draw it out really loosely because you're working on the idea, you're not working on the art. So you and, and so I cut them out, and you know, they're not very large. And then I, we set them out on the kitchen counter, and we leave them there as long as it takes. It doesn't matter if it can be three years, it doesn't matter. But um, so whenever we go, I get a cup of coffee, I look at it, and move this over here, move that over there, I'll draw another one, and, and put that in, in, in the middle of this room. And she's doing the same thing. And sometimes we do it together, and sometimes we do it separately when we're not together. So that's really pretty much how how these books exist. And, and the two that we have there, the two that we have out there already, Blind Ryan and Raisin, the Littlest Cow, started off with characters that I had. So I said, "Here, write a story," and she said, "Go to hell." <laughs> She would come up with stories for it, and um, she resisted at first, and I know that. And it's so, like, you know, you're going to do this because that's your nature. Chinese water torture. Yeah, Chinese water yeah. No, but that's her nature. It's, it's the storytelling. She's brilliant at it. So, and I'm not, and that's a great storytelling, you know. So, that's what we, that's what we do. So, you always have to choose who you are. In picture books, I can, but not in advertising. I haven't tried. Right. Right. You make that demarcation. But already in the ad world, they're already at a level where you would like to work with them. No question. Mm -hmm. the, uh, this book, the big fat book, uh, I, I know what collaboration can do uh, when it works well and it becomes uh, a third entity that is doing better than either one of the two individual people. Uh, so I like collaboration, and when I was asked to do this Ursula Gwynn book, she had been through so many years of people saying that they wanted to collaborate and then never talking to her again until the book was published and it didn't look anything like what she wanted it, uh, that when we had this conversation, which was, the conversation was, she had already told the publisher, I have to like whoever I'm going to work with, so if you want him to do it, he has to call me and I have to like him. And that is not fun. Yeah. <laughs> so I talked about collaboration. I could hear this uh, uh, note of disbelief in the voice of the elevator to the phone. Uh, she had done theater work and music work and done that kind of collaboration and loved it. So, but after four years and exchanging, oh, I don't know, thousands and thousands of emails because we 
I really did actively collaborate with her. Uh, she never would tell me what I was should illustrate, but she would make comments on what I was drawing. And it was act, and it was a really good thing because when you work on a project for that length of time, there's gonna it will always inevitably become a point where you're going, oh that'll do. And you go to the next one. Ursula never let me that do. It was like, no, well Charles, I don't think they'd wear that kind of clothes or they wouldn't look like that. Maybe they're thinking this in that scene. Um, and she kept me on my toes and then at the end about three or four months before she passed away, she sent me a book of her essays and she personalized it to the best collaborator ever. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so it was really a, a thrill to have it. I wish that she still been alive when it came out. She got to see all the art except for the very, very last piece. So it was a very gratifying. How many pieces? There are 56 pictures. Uh, I had worked on it for 40 years. It was done. It was kind of a relief that it was done. And I took about a month trying to get my brain out of RC and into other things. And just about the time I started drawing on, working on the Driftwood Days, this picture book that's going to come out in a week or so, uh, the publisher called me and said, well, Charles, we found the story of hers in our papers, and uh, it's the very last story of Ged, and we'd like you to illustrate it. And <laughs> there's both of yay. Oh, <laughs> there it was going back into the world of mercy, but it was a, it was a beautiful story. It made me cry when I read it. So, yay. Larry, you talked about journalistic art that records and celebrates the life around us. Could you speak to a little bit about for people who weren't here this morning? Yeah, journalistic art to me is uh, just journalism. Period. It's, it, Journalism records everything around us. You know, it, it, I'm, I'm drawing and drawings everything that I see, and um, it's actually to me it's, it's a comfort. It's a level of comfort. When I was a kid, uh, growing up with a, uh, a volatile mother, um, it was great. It was a great escape. So in a way, it's kind of an escape, but it's also a way of connecting with people because everyone has their own idiosyncratic way of going through life every day. So you witness how people are handling themselves in everyday situations. And so it really like emboldens and, and makes my, it opens something up in me and it, I'm more aware when I do my art. Like, okay, so a real a person in a real situation would do this a little differently. I don't think they would be doing it this way. I think they might be doing it this way. And it's a lot, a lot of it because I've observed life and I've observed how people naturally go through life. And, I, and it just gives me a sense of comfort. And you're drawn to Domier, you said, who has a body. You can tell just from the way the body is carried. Yeah, the body language, yeah. And that the little girl that found is. Had an impetus, an impetus, a start, and a beautiful photograph by Robert Frank of a little Welsh girl carrying a bundle, and he said, I'm going to use her one day. Yeah, and she's got a doll in this poor, this poor impoverished coal town in Wales, and she's got the doll wrapped up like it, and she's looking around Robert Frank's camera. And it, I knew someday I'm going to draw that girl. She's going to be in a picture book somewhere. So, but yeah, it's um, uh, drawing. Uh, we, I'm involved in a drawing club up in uh, where we live up in Colorado, in this small town. And when I went to this drawing club, I'd never seen this before. But everybody was drawing, but they weren't drawing anything but what was in their head on the paper on the journal. But somebody was drawing a cartoon. Somebody was drawing just squiggles or. And here I was drawing them. And then I flipped out. Wow, this guy's drawing us, and they were like all gathering around it. I thought, oh, that's me, that's me. And, but it also, like, it's enjoyable to draw, to be able to draw people doing it in a natural setting. So here they are. Now you can pay attention to me. You know, there's only 
One time, I remember on the train in the Green Line in Chicago, this guy was way across at the other end of the train. I was drawing him, and he saw me. And he had his hand on the rail, and then he moved it like this. And <laughs> <laughs> after it, actually, he left in front of me. I said, dude, you know, I just draw you here. You want the picture? I'll give it to you. <laughs> and I, I swear to God, he said this. And you know, in this big city, you don't see everybody. You don't see people again, right? So he said, if I ever catch you again, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be a short life. Yeah. One of you, and you have to forgive my memory. Uh, I'm thinking of Kim. He spoke about an Arthur Rackham club. Would you that say for a moment about um, for Kim? There's a... <laughs> Talked about this. Uh, the, the Arthur Rackham Society, uh, I don't know if you know who Arthur Rackham is. He's a British book illustrator, uh, probably the most popular one at the turn of the last century, up until 1940. And the Rackham Society would meet, used to meet regularly. And if you're at all a fan of his work, if, when you go to New York City, you can go to the New York Public Library, you have to call them or make an appointment. They have a physical, original art and hand-lettered copy of Midsummer Night's Dream that, did, that they commissioned him. And they also, in another department, they had a bound book of maybe 30 originals, which is really fabulous to see. But also, Columbia University has the world's largest collection of rack. And they have sketchbooks. Uh, I was there on a day when the actual curator wasn't there and there was a stack of sketchbooks. And I asked this assistant curator if I could look at some of them. And she said, as long as you put those gloves on, okay. <laughs> and it was the sketchbook he had prepared for uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, for the first one that he did. But there were, you know, in London, uh, we, the, his great-grandniece was the curator of the Frederick Warren collection at the DNA Museum, which is Beatrix Potter. So when we went out to see, she had this whole collection of, of, post, of Christmas cards, original Christmas cards that Rackham had done. And, they, and she was like, well, we have a few minutes. Would you like to look at this? I'll spread out on this table where you know the letter that Beatrix Potter did, the bunny book, yeah. first time, and all these drawings and all these paintings. Oh, and it's really like, you know, you can't touch them. But it was seeing the, seeing the original, or snakes, the watercolor. But I think Beatrix Potter was the first person I realized. I had grown up with the really bad reproduction books. You know, there were still the little books, but the color had gotten paler and paler and paler, and they were not very impressive to me. But I, they had an exhibition of her work at the Pier Point, Morgan, and it was like my head exploded seeing those originals. And they had all the fungi paintings and all, everything, and then photographs of her leaving her money in the leaves. And then, I don't have any of you read a biography of her? Because it's really cool. It's like she had every opportunity in the world to have the most horrible life in the world, but she came through it and had this, this happy, blissful existence. It's really, really cool to read. Watching the beaver at the end. 
But I started doing the drawing, and it was very, very easy to come up with it, the, the layout of the book. Uh, and, but when I tried to paint it, I couldn't. It just looked boring and crappy to me. And I kept hitting this wall and hitting this wall, and then Earthsea came along. And I just went off into Earthsea, and I kept telling the publisher, just find someone else to paint. They said, no, no, we're waiting for you. It's been four years of that. And they kept, and I kept saying, just find someone else to paint it. They went, no, no. So when it came back, that was done. I started working on this book. And for whatever reason, I picked up a colored pencil and started drawing with it. The whole book is basically done in colored pencil as opposed to with colored inks, which is what I usually use. And uh, it's got a different texture and feel. And it was really fun. And it was, went so quick. And the, the reproduction is great. Beautiful. Thank you. Larry, you have a book called Beware. I do. It's actually in my backpack. It's in the office. Yeah. I have a book called Beware that was uh, a guy named, an uh, author named Bob Rashka, who's been published, um, could not sell this manuscript. And probably because the, the whole book comprised the, every word in the book is comprised of the title the letters in the title, Beware. So there's a bear named Aiden, and there's a bee named Bree. And I don't think that editors, as smart as they are, I think sometimes they just have to see something right in front of them, you know, like everybody. You know? so, so I did this, um, I did these really, really quick thumbnail sketches, and I did a couple of finished drawings of these characters. Um, we got a publisher. So that, that just came out, I think, last week. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, it was fun for me because I was able to go down to my friend Murfell, Gerald Murfell, who I studied painting with. He lives in Colorado, and we're still very close friends. I remember his property. He has 40 acres down there. It's, it's all kind of wooded and meadow, well, which is what I wanted. I wanted the meadows to see where they live, but I also wanted the character in, in the trees. So I spent a couple of days down there just sketching in my sketchbook, and I used those sketches in the book itself. I didn't, I wasn't able to sketch any bees or any bear. <laughs> but you got to do trees, which you've always yeah. loved to do. But it's funny too because. Um, um, one of the projects I had done for Leo Burnett was an ad campaign for the Chicago Botanical Society and they had this model train that they, had, they wanted to promote. So but this, ad, uh, this ad team I worked on and I also worked on Altoids with them. <laughs> um, they came up with this campaign of these storybooks and these characters and one of the characters was a bee. And I remember that from like, I don't know, 18 years earlier, I remember that I still had it. I mean, that's what I based the bee off of. <laughs> the bee comes back. <laughs> All right, well, um, thank you both. And if you would field a few questions, if there any questions for our visitors? Thank you. And Mary, was this earlier. You said you like to work in collaboration. And I'm wondering, I mean, I understand that mostly as somebody who's starting out as a children's book illustrator that um, you don't get the opportunity. <laughs> you just, they try to keep you away from the writers. So I wondered how, was that sort of how you started? Or, uh, you know, how did you get started being able to choose who you collaborate with is what I'm asking. You know, I think it started with a book called Duel, with what's the duel between Hamilton and Burr. And, and the author lived in Evanston, which is not far from Chicago. Not that it, not that it really made a difference because you know, there's telephones and things like that. <laughs> right. But yeah, so I, start, I opened up to him and I said, hey, look, I want to work together with you on this. And we worked together on that. And <coughs> I kind of worked together with him on it, and I kind of didn't, I have to admit, because I called the editor said this text needs to be cut in half and I don't have the guts to tell the author. Can you tell him? <laughs> <laughs> and so, which is 
unusual, like not, you know, they don't take that very kindly. You know? um, but yeah, usually the editor I'm working on right now on a book for Holiday House is an author who owns a bookstore in Brooklyn, and she's on the National, the New York Times bestseller list for adult books, and the first picture book. And he's very afraid, because I asked him, can I get in touch with her? And he says, nah, don't talk about art. <laughs> <laughs> I won't talk about art. And true to my word, I have not talked about art. Although I think, you know, I asked her, about things in the book, where did she see this? Where did you see that house? What did you do? And she took pictures of this house, and it helped me a lot, because I could understand what she's talking about. And so a lot of times, um, sometimes I just go around the editor, and just email them, like, what do you think, I'm not going to go get her email address? Or right. Okay. So I, I contact them directly, and I, I ask them questions. I'm not afraid. You can either accept it or not, right? So, but usually, yeah, the editors don't like it. Yeah, because I'm sure many problems in the past. Chris? Um, did you tell But all of Hollywood is looking at every single comic book that comes 
out with an idea of what I can develop into the next Marvel Universe. So there's a lot of money floating around. Uh -huh. uh, but there's, as soon as, if it, you don't have the right contract, then it zooms off and they'll do anything they want with it. And whatever they think sells is what will happen. So that's, you just have to start with a, whatever contract they send, you need to let a lawyer look at it. A lot of times you might change that contract and they won't let, they won't pay you to do the book, but it's really better instead of having to a quarterback version of your story. With your name attached. With your name attached, yes. Yeah. It's a scary thing. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we do have a reception in the next room. We have some books to be signed, maybe in the room. Cookies are that. <laughs>